In this video, we're going to talk more about angiosperm diversity, so some of the different kinds of angiosperms that exist. So first, let's take a look at the classification of angiosperms. So they are in domain eukarya, so this just means that they are made of eukaryotic cells. And by this point, you hopefully know the difference between eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells. But just remember that eukaryotic cells, kind of the defining feature is that they have a nucleus surrounded by a membrane. But they also have other membrane-bound organelles like mitochondria and chloroplasts, some of them, um, the endoplasmic reticuli, the Golgi apparatus, et cetera, et cetera. They also have multiple bar-shaped chromosomes that are organized by histone proteins. And if you recall, we, we have talked about two other domains. We've talked about domain bacteria and domain archaea. And so now we're talking about domain eukarya. Plants in general are in the supergroup Archeoplastida. Remember that this also includes the protists, and more specifically, the red and green algae. Plus plants. They are in kingdom Plantae, which makes sense. And then all angiosperms are in the same phylum known as Anthophyta. Most angiosperms have what we call perfect flowers. And a perfect flower, it doesn't mean that it's the most beautiful or something like that. It just means that each flower has both the male and female parts to it. So if a flower contains both stamens and carpels, then it is called a perfect flower. Because both male and female structures are present, these plants are able to self-pollinate, which ultimately leads to self-fertilization. Um, however, cross-pollination is more likely and it's typically more beneficial. And it's really more beneficial because it helps to increase genetic diversity. So self-pollination, um, you're, you're keeping the same genes that are already in the plant and just putting them back together. But if you cross-pollinate, meaning you take pollen from one plant and transfer it to a totally different plant, now you are bringing in genes from another plant and mixing them together in order to create kind of a new genetic combination. There are anatomical and environmental factors that um, sometimes prevent self-pollination. For example, it's possible that the pollen grains mature at a different time than the ovule. So even though the pollen grains and the ovule are nearby, if one's not ready, then it's not going to be able to self-pollinate. Now, some flowers are not quote unquote perfect flowers. And so these are going to be flowers where um, some flowers contain just the carpels and other flowers contain just the stamen. Now, if both of these flowers are on the same plant, so basically if you have carpal flowers, and stamen flowers on the same plant is called monoecious. And mono means one. So we still have the two different uh, sexual structures, but they're on the same plant. Dioecious, dio means two. And this means that the male and female flowers are located on totally separate plants. It is believed that all angiosperms evolved from a single common ancestor, which makes them monophyletic. Um, and then there are three major groups that have kind of diverged or evolved from this common ancestor. So we'll talk a little bit more about basal angiosperms, monocots, and dicots, which are also called eudicots. 
So first, let's take a look at basal angiosperms. And these are plants that have characteristics of both monocots and dicots. And we'll talk a little bit more about these monocot and dicot features on the following slides. So some examples of basal angiosperms are going to be things like water lilies, magnolia trees, which those are the ones that have kind of the large white flowers that we see a lot in South Carolina. Laurels and also pepper plants. So now we're going to talk about the monocots and dicots, and I'm going to talk about them together to kind of compare and contrast them. So remember, they're both angiosperms. They just have some different characteristics from each other, so they're kind of separate lineages. So first of all, the defining difference between dicots and monocots is the number of cotyledons they have. And so a cotyledon, you can see that on the picture here, is this structure that helps to deliver nutrients from the endosperm to the developing embryo. Dicots, D-I, stands for two. And so they have two cotyledons, which we can see on this picture here as one and two. Monocots, mono means one. And so they have one cotyledon which we can see here. Dicots have flower parts in groups of four or five. So you can see on this picture here, we have one, two, three, four, five petals. This also applies to things like stamen. Monocots have flower parts in groups of three. So here we've got one, two, three, and then we've got another kind of round, so four, five, six. And so when we say groups of three, it could be multiples of three. So it could be three, six, nine, etc. And this also applies to the stamen as well. Angiosperms are vascular plants, which means that they do have phloem and xylem. And in dicots, the vascular tissue in the stem is arranged in these rings. So you can see these um, kind of rings here. In monocots, in the stem, the vascular tissue doesn't really have a pattern. It's just kind of randomly scattered um, kind of throughout the, the diameter of the stem. Now, if we look at the vascular tissue in the root, in dicots, it makes this kind of X shape in the middle. So remember, we've got our xylem and then phloem. And in monocots, it makes a ring in the middle. Now, this can be confusing because remember, in dicots, if we look at the vascular tissue in the stem, it forms a ring. Whereas in the monocots, the root forms a ring, and in the stem, it's random with no pattern. And I should point out in this picture, what we're looking at is a cross section of a root. So if you had a root like this, a cross section would be cutting it like this and then looking at it from like the top down. Dicots typically have a large tap root, which is this big root kind of coming down here. And there may be some fibrous lateral roots coming off of it. With monocots, they don't have that defining tap root, but they do have these kind of fibrous roots kind of coming out at all different angles. On the leaves of dicots, they have these branched veins. So you can see these veins here, and they also kind of branch off here. And in monocot leaves, the 
veins are parallel, so they kind of run along the length of the leaf. Of the two types, dicots are more prevalent than monocots. So two thirds of all flowering plants are classified as dicots. Some maybe kind of common examples are things like peas, roses, beans, buttercups, oak trees, and sunflowers. Some examples of monocots that you might be familiar with include lilies, orchids, yucca, asparagus, grasses, palms, rice, cereal grains, corn, sugarcane, bananas, and pineapples. On this slide, I want to kind of talk about the diversity of fruit that is produced by angiosperms. And this isn't necessarily a difference between monocots and dicots. This is just looking at the fact that fruit can come in different varieties. So the fruit actually comes from the walls of the ovary. After an egg has been fertilized and a seed has developed inside the ovary. Sometimes there's other tissue involved, but for the most part, we're just gonna say the ovarian walls form the fruit. Now the fruit that you're probably most familiar with is this fleshy fruit, which tends to be juicy and sweet. So things like, I don't know why I have parries here, but cherries, peaches, apples, grapes, and tomatoes. So yes, tomato is a fruit. But fruit can also be dry. And so things like rice, wheat, and nuts are also technically classified as fruit. The function of fruit, the main function is seed dispersal. So the goal is the remember the seeds are inside this fruit. And so the goal is to get those seeds transported somewhere else so that they can then inhabit another area. So different seeds have different kind of modifications or adaptations, depending on how they are typically dispersed or spread. So some fruits are really light and feathery, and those are the ones that are going to be dispersed by the wind. Some of them are um, kind of not very dense and are able to float, and those are dispersed by water. Fleshy, tasty fruit is often eaten by animals, and either the animal eats the fruit and then just discards the seeds wherever it is, or the fruit and the seeds might pass through the animal's digestive tract, and then when the animal defecates or poops, those seeds are deposited in the scat, and they'll then germinate wherever they land. Some seeds also have burrs, and um, if you've ever, you know, watch your dog maybe in a, a wooded area, you've probably had to pick, you know, little burrs off of your your pet. Um, and these birds are, or these burrs are designed for uh, seed dispersal, and so they stick to things, and then um, the animal moves around, and then they eventually fall off or get removed, and now they've been transported to another area.